the Thinking Tackle podcast. Joining me today in the studio is former podcast guest Elliot Gray and journalist and filmmaker Rich Stewart. Now, over the years, the pair of them have documented many hours worth of spectacular carp fishing footage. So they're in the studio today to discuss their experiences while filming, including some memorable catches, some spectacular carp caught on camera and interviews with many of your favourite anglers. So lots to look forward to. We really hope you enjoy the show. I remember when you when you said to me, it's, we're Rick, live, Rick, that Rick, made Rick, me Rick freeze just that just clocked it, I can see that. What is it? What is going on? Oh, <laughs> is he live now? He knows. <laughs> so, Rich, it's that good? You, you, you wanted to know it. Stop trying to trick us with this. What is it then? <laughs> Mate, it's that good. It's gone already. It's it's not an electric shock. It's just Toby raises his hand and it's the Welcome no. to Thinking Tackle podcast. We are live. <laughs> was that what it was? <laughs> Like I said, mate, we don't. Is that dispelled the myth a little bit for you? It has. It's completely ruined it. Yeah. Yeah, you should do. We've also ruined it for our entire viewing yeah. figure, like, audience as well. <laughs> no, we'll just edit this bit out, Tove, won't mm. we? No, we don't edit anything out. No, well, no. Maybe, maybe you might. first. No. You just need to install the electric shock <laughs> yeah. button. But, but before the monster carp one, so he was going like, apparently he was going like this. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> kept doing it. He my got, shoulder got, got tired. by the screen, isn't he? Well, I move over here. Rich saw it. Yeah, but on that one, for some reason, I could not see it. I'd spoon us out here, and uh, I, I couldn't see it. We were we were about twenty minutes in, Tobe, weren't we? <laughs> yeah, it was a long way in. <laughs> it like, wasn't like five Tobe, or ten. Well, what's that phone? Oh. I mean, I, I know, I know you oh. want us to, uh, I know you want us to warm up a little bit, but this is <laughs> this is going a bit too far. Pete's was the best one. Do you remember Pete's? Um, We'd have pre-rolled for a couple of minutes. That was going for ages as well, wasn't it? Yeah, not that long. It was only about five minutes or so, but he got incredibly impatient and um, and then turned me around and asked me when the fuck I'm going to start <laughs> this right. thing. Well, Regan done that as well, didn't he? He said, when, when's this podcast going to start? That's what I said, start? Pete, yeah. Pete Regan. What one he already had? Oh, yeah, mate. It's been going for about five minutes. You think, <laughs> Pete, you've just ruined it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, Elliot Gray, Rich Stewart, we are live. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to be back. No worries, no worries. Rich, first time. Absolutely, but this is very much <laughs> familiar territory for me. Although, the, only the second time I've been to the, the latest incarnation of the quarter headquarters, I used to beat this path along the N25 A127 quite regularly for uh, five years, I think. Yeah. Because yeah. you guys came in here, didn't you, to do Danny's um, topography piece, didn't you? We did, we did. And I think that, to be fair, like, I think I'd left quarter only well, you three years, just probably. left. Three years. It wasn't even that long. Or was ago. it not? No, no. Mm. So, um, but Rich, you're like the the voice of you're like the Stig of topography, aren't you? Well, well, <laughs> he's the other way. It's the other side of the camera from this time. Yeah. Well, it's funny when we when we had a little um, getting to know you Zoom call, Si, you were like, I've never seen you before, which means that you've never been on YouTube and Google Floater Fishing because for, <laughs> for a long time, no. the only thing anyone ever knew me for was was a few quarter floater fishing. Uh, there you go, Toby. Films. Get that one up. <laughs> yeah, thingy tackle. Um, but Did it get a lot of views then? Millions. Yeah, probably the biggest viewed films ever. But no, um, <laughs> really? but, but crucially, the thing was, I probably, I probably float a fish once a year. And everyone would come up to me at the shows and be like, oh, you're the floater fishing guy. And I'd be like, yeah, but, you know, I've got a nine to five job and it's when it's hot, I'm stuck in the office. So, yeah, actually, complete. Wasn't that fish, like, biblically, sing, uh, single hook bait slammed out to the middle? Like, on a even it was a hard, really hard day's floater fishing. And I'm sure you ping that out there to the middle of the pond yeah. and a fish just came up on a single out in the middle. Well, like, he'd been trying to catch one off the top all day and they were being a pain. Yeah, yeah, and it, that's the, and exact the fish just Toby, yeah, you're a life saver, right? What, right, what right. a god, Toby! Clark, I know. Right? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's first cast really onto feeding fish, nobbled the little pink, gooed up hook bait, and somehow, somehow, I've, he's coming through the weed. Whereabouts was this? And keep real, really that's the eighty pads lake. Sorry. So if you'd, <laughs> if you'd done your research, you'd have been watching these already, surely. So <laughs> Sorry, no, I don't know. I've never seen it. He's hanging on in there. But that wasn't even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we did a masterclass and a thinking tackle. Oh, um, and this was this was later. What, but God cemented will. my reputation Biggest as like falsely. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like you get imposter syndrome. Everyone's like, you're the floater guy. Yes, well, kind of. I, only because I was filmed three times. <laughs> <laughs> Just always floater yeah. fishing. Yeah. Oh, I, I this should was have been embarrassed. I should have watched this. I mean, the, the Yateley Pad Lake as well. So, what did you actually end up landing here? 
it's a, it's a, it's a lovely. I mean, common. bizarrely, it's a common for starters, um, which was a shock, wasn't it, really, El? Yeah. And a gnarly old common, um, and and like El said, there you go. Did I film that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's the music? It's a Redmere common, that isn't it? Surely, that's a classic Redmere common. That is. Really, I don't think it's one it, of the stockfish, is it? I reckon um, it is. It looks too much like one to be, to not be that. No, I mean, I don't think it's one of the sort of of the um, fish pond. No, 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 it's not. No. That'll be a Redmere common, almost certainly. So that had a lot of views. I don't know. Probably not. I mean, <laughs> no. why would it? It's me. <laughs> so, how many views did that have? Just under fifteen thousand. This that's is not bad. See, is it? this is that's why right. I, I retired to the other side of the camera. Yeah, right. Side. Yeah. Right. But yes, I, I, I guess these days I'm happily the other side of the camera, apart from today, which uh, is a rare treat. So, Do you know what? You could be an absolute nuisance at times because um, Danny or other people in the office will say, oh, you want to listen to Rich do it? Because he always asks really, really good questions. They always say it. I, was, they, I get complimented for it on Rich's behalf. All the t- or people ring me up or text me to say how good a job Rich does all the time. And he is very, 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 very good at right. being that and, side and, of it. And I kind of... F- well, thank you for saying that. I, 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 it's much appreciated. So I and I just fell into it, really. You know, I don't think it's. We didn't set out to be like Rich is going to interview somebody. In fact, our first nah. interview was the last time I was here. And we did it with Dan, and it was yeah. kind of a bit of a. You'd have to say we don't. We wouldn't shoot it like that today. No, we didn't even have a second audio. Your audio didn't even. And I remember we put it on YouTube, and people were moaning because they didn't have quite rightly. The, yeah, as they would. But back then, it hadn't really been done either. The whole like two guys in the fishing, in fishing, two guys talking interview style on camera. You know, we just went there and did it. That was a nice and, little insight, that wasn't it? You re-released that as well, didn't? Did, yeah. So you put the topography out, and then you put the, the the single video out as well. That's done really well as well, hasn't it? But it's it? only half an hour as well. Like we yeah. filmed that; it was half an hour long, I think. And I remember us thinking that was a long film. Like we've got this. Imagine if you got fair, but imagine being out pin fair brass down now for an interview, and after half an hour going to him, "Cheers, mate, <laughs> done." That's what we did. Like, you know, we'd have had him for hours and hours if we could now, but back then half an hour it was a long we were questioning whether people would sit still for half an hour listening to that form of you know because having worked a quarter it was all about inter- like raw entertainment from the word go you know tactics action and that's the polar opposite isn't it two guys sat on a yeah sat at a table it's uh nick said that to us as well when he was in here that it, it this, this environment was alien and it you know I think he was saying that, you know, you should be out on the bank really doing this. And you think, no, this is what makes this a little bit different. It's the fact that you're seeing people. I know you had tight lines and stuff like that, but this was a, this is a whole different... It's personal, this, yeah. I think. It's much yeah. more personal, isn't it? And actually seeing Dan actually arrive for work and stuff like that. People yeah. like that, don't they, with a the building yeah. and... Yeah, with his know, music playing like? in, in his yeah, car yeah, and that. Yeah. yeah. I think that actually, so I just hit the nail on the head there, it was our day in the a life. day in the life. Film. It wasn't yeah. even an interview film, but yeah. that... That kind of, I think the popularity of that kind of spawned this idea that we could go a bit more, yeah. like long format, a bit slower, you know. And actually, I think Daryl was next, wasn't he? Yeah, but again, it was a half, half an hour long. long. Yeah, you know, perhaps we weren't quite there yet. But that, but the, it's been a surprise actually, moving out of the kind of corporate world when you've got to get stuff across quickly, to realise that there is an appetite for something someone can settle into. And actually, there's been a whole like a lot of stuff bloom around us like this like this podcast you know where people are you know they really get into it and, and i'm the same so i think it's God, people I mean, isn't it's, it people I mean, are you know people love people they like the story and they like getting to know i think if you if you know someone as an angler but that's all you know them as it's probably the same as football you know you know as someone as a great footballer there's nothing more interesting after following them for five years than to hear about their their life as a person which everyone is in, at the end of the day, aren't they? I, I, I've been surprised at you know the amount of people that want to listen to a couple of people talking, you know, non-stop for three hours. Though that was a that was a surprise for us and a bonus as well, because, because with the, the the podcast thing, the the MP3 thing is you know the driving and the listening. You don't necessarily need to be um, listening, do you, when you're driving? But the the when people are watching things visually, you know, it's um, people. You've, you've got people's attention then, mm. and um, but we're going to get into all this mm. sort of stuff on the podcast, aren't we? And talk about some of your uh, most fondest moments, best fish catches. Get some uh, get some stories on the anglers and stuff that you've done for sure, and some nice exclusives. Yeah, um, Al. Thankfully, um, I didn't ask you, but you've brought a, a gift in for us. Well, I didn't. I didn't want to not bring one. So, the last time I came, I gave you 
this, didn't I? So basically, I'm a person that I get rid of stuff or I keep stuff. If I keep it, it's because it's sacred. And if I get rid of it, it's because I didn't need it. So it's hard for me to give people stuff because if I've kept it, that means I don't want to give it to you. But I've got a... This is a sopography cup, just a normal cup. Okay. This here is the first piece of sopography merchandise. Do you, do you want to hold that at the camera, Al? This way? You that one then, that, mate. That way? Which one? Yeah, this one. one. So that is the first piece of sopography merchandise I ever got made. I got hundreds of these done, and I hated them because the colour was wrong, so I've never done anything with them. They're just in my cupboard. <laughs> um, but the significance of that is this was the first piece of sopography merchandise we ever had made. So that's a sticker you can have. And then this here is the sheets of paper that I sat on at the North Met designing the right. topography logo. Stop it. Now that's cool. But unfortunately, so the <laughs> origin, the two bits of paper that I actually drew the logo on, so I drew it on one and then I put another piece over it and I traced it and re perfected it. I've had those two framed in there and they're at home now. But these are the other eight sheets of paper or whatever it was. We that, might do the same I, with those, Al. That I sat there and... So I'm... Yeah, you haven't got the actual thingies because, like I say, that's sacred to me. But this lump of paper here, yeah, is where... That's where what it it's all, all about, Tobe, on here, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, like, it's having different, different, you know, things that really mean something. And um, I like the process as well with the... Um, with, 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 with the illustration, with the design. You know, yeah. you started with a cup and then you ended up... Yeah, and I think, you know, the... The, when I look back at these now, you just think like I don't even know what that is. It looks like. Does it look like a? It's like. <laughs> well, you can see it's a carp of some sort of. Yeah. I don't know what it. Yeah. It's, do Do you know what Pete Castle's one picture behind you actually? It's got that sort of shape to it, hasn't it? But the, I think the best thing that ever happened really with sopography um, was that we didn't go down the carp route. You know, that sopography was going to be called carpography. Um, very last minute I don't know I think I might have spoke about this before but last minute I had to change the name by uh, someone rang me and said it was infringing on their name so I changed it from carpography to sipography and in actual fact that's the best thing that we've ever done yeah you know? and the, the not having a carp in the logo or you know or a typical carp in the logo um, and the word carp in the name when I look back at it now is a sipography it's a, it's, a, it's a cleverer word isn't it and um, so so I mean that that's tail, isn't it? Holding Mary. That was the yeah. That was, that was the yeah. that was the, the yeah. yeah the inspiration. Yeah. Oh, the irony. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. know, but that picture in itself. And we can't get I him mean, on. You can't get him on. No, we try and try no. all the time, but maybe one day. I'm sure one day we will. Yeah, we we try as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tell <laughs> we're all trying. Tell we're here. Yeah. <laughs> but ring <laughs> us first. Yeah. <laughs> if you have to choose between the two of us, pick us. Oh, I don't know about that. You can't say that. We're, you're in our studio. <laughs> no, we, we'd all like to. I mean, he's, a, he's, you know, he's always going to be in demand, isn't he? And um, I took it for granted, actually, because he'd done um, a water park um, uh, presentation about five or six years ago, maybe longer than that ago now. And I mean, the crowds were there and you just took it for granted. Oh, that's Terry Hearn. But once you've got into this sort of stuff and you realise how difficult he mm. is to actually pin down, it's... Um, I don't think he was years ago, though. Right. I don't... Because I, when we started this, I was planning all sorts of stuff to do with Tell. <laughs> We'd be like, we could do this, we could do that. We'll go here, then we'll do that. What would you have done with him then? Or what would well, you I do? Think, well, you're different to me. I would like Rich to interview him. If I could pick, that's what I would do. Just it, do the interview? I would do a for the record interview. But I don't think Rich would. You'd probably want to do a proper film with him, wouldn't you? I think. Well, I've already interviewed him once for Carpology, um, so I'm sure you're the same side. So you kind of. I feel like yes, of course, we could come up with some different stuff. But I asked him the stuff I asked him because I thought that was what I wanted to ask him, and that was my interview then. So uh, would we do? Yeah, I'd, I'd, it'd be lovely to get film. out with him on the yeah. bank. You know, yeah, in his natural habitat. You know. Um, the interview that I did with him I mean that was kind of that was the culmination I mean getting out with Tell and thanks to Joe Wright for organising it because um, otherwise I don't think I would have done but getting out with Tell was kind of the he was the last guy that was a supreme influence that I got to work with and um, I'm not ashamed to say that 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 was important to me you know to sort of almost um, just to just to spend some time with the guy and and he is still an influence. 
of course he is. He's still he's still the man, really, isn't he? So, uh, so yeah. Whether I whether I could come up with an interview, yeah, of course I could. But would it? I'd love to have asked those questions for us. Yeah. But you know, it's a good carpology interview as well. Oh, I just couldn't imagine fishing with him. If we filmed him, I wouldn't want to be on film with him. I wouldn't. I honestly wouldn't. Like most people, I would. You're I, weird about being on film with people as well. Certain people, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be on film with Tell. I just wouldn't. Like, Why I wouldn't is that? Feel, I would rather film him. If I, if I was going to work with him in that sense, on fishing, I just, I'd rather it was just about him. I wouldn't want it to be, I just wouldn't, I don't know why, I wouldn't want to fish with him. I'd happily film him, but that would be my ideal scenario, it's just me and Rich film tell, but I'm not in the film alongside him. I wouldn't want that. Do you think, Rich, in some respects, that that's quite a challenging interview as well? Because tells tells a, a, a well-known storyteller. But if we were doing something like this with him, we'd probably like to get into a real conversation. It is. It's. It definitely is. And and when, when I interviewed him, I wanted to try and ask the awkward questions. But you know, in the presence of greatness, you kind of, I don't know. I did, but, but really, we were both waiting for him to just tell his tales. And I think he's more comfortable doing that I mean I hope I'm not speaking out of turn but I'm sure he's happier doing that than being asked awkward questions about his life which ultimately makes for a better interview doesn't it we, we you know we both know that it's it's kind of what you do um so but but you know we'd just work I mean any of us we'd do whatever we'd work with tell um mm. but I don't I, yeah, yeah quick fire quick fire questions would be enough three minutes yeah. long, quick fire questions that I do your best quick fire <laughs> one recently was uh, was was uh, you were talking about putting people on the spot and throwing those curveball questions mm. in Luke's one was uh, that was, that was <laughs> very or, very was good straight as a curve oh that made me it? laugh <laughs> <laughs> so appropriate as well, yeah. wasn't it? I curlers like or straighteners? That. I do like to do that. Too. No, it was, no, it was curling. It can't be straighteners because he's got no, curly, no, 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 no. Curlers, curling iron, curling, yeah, curling iron or or, or roll. Was it rollers? rollers or curling iron? Yeah, yeah. That's what it was. And uh, did he actually answer that question? I don't even. I can't remember. Probably not. No, he called me a the word I'm not. I signed the paper I signed at the start with a word I'm not allowed to say, say on word. it. He called no. me one of them. We were saying with with interviewing people and talking to certain people, you 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 feel it's 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 important to build up a rapport with people and um you know and get some um and, and and have a little bit of energy back with the person as well that's that's really important to you rich yeah yeah however um a lot of these guys you know much like yourself so si, we're meeting them for the first time sometimes i mean although there are probably i don't know what 75 percent of people that we interview one of us will know mm. um because we've been in the trade for a while but those 25% that we don't know, you're kind of walking into their house and you've got to get something going on the day and they're probably really nervous. So that is probably the, the, you know, the first few minutes of any interview are the most challenging. And I always struggle with the first question because you, it's like before that it's pure silence. They're waiting mm. for you to initiate something. I want it to sound right. And, and, it's sometimes it's tough to know what to drop as that first question because you want it something that they're going to feel comfortable with and be able to lead off on but um yeah it's it can be that's the often the biggest challenge is trying to put people at ease yeah and some people can be very nervous and seem confident until you actually start the interview as well you've you've probably experienced that as well with people yeah not naming any names no. we, we have had some horror sh horror stories one or two not many, because most people, you're on familiar territory for them. You want to talk about their life, and even the shyest guy is going to gonna be able to do that. But it's, it's kind of, yeah, we've had a couple of tough moments where we thought, are we even going to get something here? Without naming any names. Understandably, though, as well. Because yeah, it course. is, like I said, when I did this the first time with you, I shit myself. When you said we were live, <laughs> and I didn't think I would care, in the, but when you just go, right, we're live now, it changes the game, like... Yeah. And I think, for, well, I think I said this to you before, but to sit in your front room with uh, me and Rich there, three cameras on you, and it, it's all on you, you know. At least there's a few of us here, or it's just two people. But when there's all these cameras, it's quite a scary thing to do, it's, I think. It's quite interesting because you're making a familiar place quite uncomfortable for them, isn't yeah. it? So that must be really difficult. Like really actually. uncomfortable. And sometimes we move all their stuff around. We move, they pick their sofa up. Like we move it. Room. We <laughs> jiggle it all around, you know, and then and all of a sudden it's, right, has it, always, has it always got to be at that house? I mean, do they ever say, we like to do we'd that, rather right? do it somewhere else? Or No, because for what we said earlier, take them away 
from where people it doesn't have to be the house it can be their could be their it could be their mum's house their nan's house whatever but we don't want it to be at the lake it's giant to be at the lake that's all yeah because it it says something about them it, we think it, it probably brings a bit more of them than than a sort of neutral setting would you learn a bit more about somebody when you can see where they live how they live the things that they've got around them things that are important to them uh, and that kind of acts as a bit of an extension a bit of a visual extension of what we're trying to do with the with the interview you know a visual extension for sure because people like you know like through the keyhole you know, yeah. pe people are just really curious to know what other people's lives are like behind you know but some people's houses who who was it we went to and the other day, you just have no idea they were an angler if you didn't yeah. know there was an angler i think most people mo but so some it's either one way or the other so you, they've either got like this carp room and everywhere you look there's bits and pieces or they have none there is nothing you know and yeah. that's quite interesting you don't know what you're gonna you don't know you don't know what you're gonna get when you walk into someone's house yeah and i'm sure a lot of the time they've they might have moved a few bits around tidied up or whatever but I, I think it's really an interesting um, kind of extension of where they see angling within their life. Like sometimes mm. people annex it often; it's very private, and they don't talk to their wife about it or their, you know, family. Other times, it it's everywhere in the house, and you can't escape it. I don't know. I think okay, you, sometimes there's not even a picture of a carp, and sometimes there are walls full of these yeah. things, aren't there? So. Mm. Um, so normally like if they're married less if they're, they're less pictures on the walls there's got to be a bit <laughs> yeah. of a yeah there's got to be yeah. some sort of compromise yeah. yeah you you were saying as well with with topography and stuff it, we that it it was it was more about you you guys are very much you, you're you're into history rich and documenting mm. um carp fishing history yes absolutely it's, that's the, for me that's the main thrust of what of what we're doing with so much of sip not all of it because some of it is entertainment there's also a good tranche of stuff that we're doing because we feel like we want to collect a library of information about the carp fishing scene now that, I mean, who knows where it's going to end up, but that motivates us. Mm. I wouldn't say we're collectors, you know, we're more documenters, you know, like I enjoy shooting documentary stuff more than I do live action stuff. I enjoy human stories more than I enjoy rig sequences. Um, we're not doing this to make money obviously the fact that we can pay our mortgages is fantastic but our primary motivation is to document the scene that we see around us and it was and it was always important i say sorry we i'm sure el will have his own take on this for me it is um i was like a quite a geeky kid when it comes to carp fishing when i growing up in the northwest i wasn't part of a scene like in merseyside there wasn't a carp scene that i could access as, as like a 13 year old so all of my kind of the stuff I read was was like a lifeblood, um, and the the influences that I drew from that still hold to this day. But the, because literature was so important to me, and there was no um, you know other types of media available, because literature was so important to me, that kind of the documenting of fishing has, re has remained important to me. Um, you know, I read everything. Um, you know, you had to, didn't you? I know you've had mm. many people say that there wasn't stuff, there wasn't anything else to do. So. I read the magazines, I read the books, and I've still got them all, and I still like to document the stuff. So that that is one of the main thrusts, I si, without doubt. What's your What's your background? Because you, you you've been working in um, media industry and fishing for for, for a long time. So um, yeah. where did all that start? So I think so. I did I did a marine and freshwater biology degree and thought probably to all intents and purposes I would probably because of the fish obviously um, and to all intents and purposes probably would have gone into some kind of fishery science uh, loved uni so much that I went back and did, did a master's in fish ecology again more fish um, and came out of that and I'd seen a, an advert and in fact it was my, my auntie sent me a, um, a copy of a magazine with an advert in it saying editorial assistant wanted for DHP which was the publisher of Tolk Carp but still is and Advanced Carp, amongst many other magazines, and I was a magazine geek. So I honestly, I, I hoarded the things. Yeah. I could, I memorised the things. You know, the pictures, the words, and so that. So really, someone designed a job for me. And I remember speaking to Sal, who is my wife now, was a girlfriend then. She was like, you know, you, you're over. But she was, she's a journalist, so editorial assistants like the lowest of the low, really. And she was like, you're overqualified for this. And I, and I was like, well. But, you know, it's a dream job. And 
I went for interview, got the job. It was based in rugby at DHP, which was the hub. It employed like 80 staff at the time. Like It felt like I'd just landed in the middle of the carp scene when the magazines were at their absolute peak. Total Carp was the biggest deal in fishing. If you, if you were in that magazine, it was pop, you know, you could make your brand. Um, and and that, that, to be honest, to this day, that was the best office I worked in, uh, the most fun that I had probably, uh, because we were together doing it. You know, ever since then, it's been, I've been working in a bit of a silo, you know, whether it's through SIP, even at Corda, I wasn't in the office very much. So, but, but it was, you never quite recapture the kind of, um, the, the intensity of those early days and working on the magazine in those early days was just incredible. Mm. And, and as it happened, it was the very start of the decline of magazines. Um, and I think I, I kind of just about jumped off that, that ship, mm. unfortunately, but, um, but incredible times. And I think th the, the jump was to Corda, by the way. So, so obviously I went from being a... Um, what was your job position at Corda? So I, was, I left the editorship of Advanced Carp Fishing Magazine um, which was all I ever wanted to do. And lots of people went into that company to get poached because the, that was the route. There was like a talent s sort of highway there. You know, you could, sh you, you got to meet everyone in the trade and eventually you got picked up because, you know, your skills as a photojournalist were in demand back then. I didn't want to get poached. As a magazine geek, I wanted to edit the magazine and that was it. That's all I desired, honestly. And uh, yeah, Damo um, offered me a, basically offered me a job. There was no interview. There was no job. Um, there wasn't. It wasn't a vacancy. So I, so I came here kind of with a bit of a widish remit, and actually followed in Jimmy Armstrong's footsteps. Our, our close mate, you know, James and I had worked together at DHP. James became the very first like angling photojournalist on the corporate side of the fence. <coughs> you know, in a very groundbreaking role under Ali. And, and that department was widening, so I just came on to sort of bolster the resources in that kind of photojournalism side. And actually, had I not done that, I wouldn't have picked up a video camera. So, mm. and here we are. So, yeah, that's that's the kind of that decline. Did you did you did you see where the decline was actually going towards digital, more visual? It was tough to see. The causes were multiple to start with, I think, but but there was no doubt the decline. Uh, like I remember being in a meeting one time and and. One of the kind of big wigs said, five percent up, but five percent down is the new up for magazines. Like a managed decline was the best you could hope for. But yeah, because because of social media, mm. really. Um, you know, it's, Facebook took out carp talk in a matter of years, didn't it? It, it had the, there was no news to be broken anymore because everyone already knew. Mm. And and although the the monthlies hung on, and Carpology do a wonderful job, um, and long may they continue to do that. Um, you know, DHP was a kind of a huge beast, like a fairly bloated as well at the time. You know, you had lots of people on big wages, um, lots of management, and I think they had to slim down. Like-minded people, all similar, similar no. passion, or no, all like when you've got a company with eighty people, as you might expect, they came from all across the spectrum. People that didn't fish, people that were passionate fish uh, anglers who were out every night, um, everyone everyone and, and, and often you get it with management when you get to a certain level of seniority and and when you're sort of the draws on your time are greater because of that you don't go so I never got that hot you know as, as editor I was still going fishing a lot and you have to because you've got to maintain that that kind of um, connection with fishing mm. otherwise wh who are you talking to you're not talking to like-minded people you're talking to like anglers that you, and you don't even fish anymore so yeah are you, are you on a similar page to Rich? I, I, I get, I get the no. feeling you two are like yin and yang. We yang are a very bit, different. Aren't you? Yeah. So yeah. I read, you know, I read, but I didn't really read. I read to learn when I was a kid. You know, I have how much angling literature have I read? Hardly any, really. I've just always loved going fishing. You know, that's you know, and that's what I've always put my, ev you know, everything into really. Um, I don't. I, if it was Terry, I read it, I watched it, or whatever. But really, if you compared us. You know, we are very different in those um, in those ways, but it's not because I don't want to read it or uh, as such. I just I just haven't. Like my all of my um, angling journalism, whatever, has just all stem from from loving fishing mm. and wiggling my way through Corda from one job to another to one that I actually loved doing, which was being outside, talking to anglers, learning from them, documenting what they did. 
you know, I'm, a, I'm an artistic person, so you give me a camera, let me spend, you know, a day making things look pretty and taking it all home on a memory card, and that yeah. was that was good for me, you know. Um, but no, it, it, I guess we are very different. I think if you actually, you know, if you know me and Rich, we have a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot about us that, that is. It works, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you you need you need a bit of a you need contrasting characters, don't you? Mm. And uh, are you, we were talking about Tell's book. We're t- we're talking about Tell a bit at the moment. We've mm. been talking about Tell a bit on the last few podcasts. Actually, it keeps uh, keeps popping up. You're surprised with his um, his book sales and stuff because we we think that this stuff's on, in the demise a little bit at the moment. But um, not when it's him, though. Is he, is he the I don't know how many he's sold, and neither, I, don't, I guess neither of us know how many he's sold. You hear, you hear things, but the numbers I've heard that he sold, not in rem, not remotely surprised. You know, mm. people waited, was it 15, 14 years for that book? I think it was. 2008 or nine. Yeah, you know, years and years and years and years and years. You know, it was but, earlier than that, Rich, yeah. wasn't it? So, oh, oh, 06. Yeah, yeah. Mm. He's kept him waiting There's a one while. here, look, we could check. Yeah, I know. Well, you carry on. Yeah. yeah, so, no, I think, um, you know, certain people have the power and will always have the power to do things like, you know, what he's done with that book. Um, I know, yeah, I know we were criticised, we would see the odd comment and it's like, you know, podcasting and doing this type of thing and it's, you're, you're taking away, you know, those, uh, those people that love to read books and, um, you know, by doing this type of thing, but it's just... I love to listen to podcasts. I don't love to read books, so I don't see what the, I don't see what the problem is there. Mm. You know, I think if you love to read books, you'll, you'll always read a book, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, although it's much harder. I don't know if anyone else out there feels the same, but certainly when when I've kind of really got into the social media and, and the scrolling, my brain has become so restless that I can't settle to the pace of a book very quick, very easily at all. It's, it's like a real conflict. I sit down and my mind is racing. It wants to flick and, and scroll. And, and you obviously, to read a, a, just a page is a few minutes yeah. worth of investment. So it takes me a while to kind of calm and and um so as a result probably i don't read as much as i did so maybe there's something in that but i but i think by making stories accessible to people then it's doing the same thing i always me. think people i'm pe- pe- people always tell me i'm wrong for saying this but i always i've always said reading something or watching something or listening to it reading isn't as good as hearing it from either seeing it on a tv screen or hearing it from the horse's mouth see, see, whereas I, a lot of people disagree but for me personally I like to watch or listen more than I like to read. Like, I can just remember some of those early cart fishing books, and I was like you, Rich. I, you know, I used to devour every mm. single cart fishing book that came out, and and books. You know, although the word was there in text, you still had to use your imagination to actually be able to 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 to, to see it as well. And um, you know, that kind of perception of what you thought you were kind of reading was just so magical. The the thing I'm worried about with cart fishing books nowadays is they're the way the way cart fishing books are written, there's almost like this this kind of blueprint for how a book should 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 come across, and it can sometimes get um, you know a little bit not over exaggerated, but you know just um, it doesn't necessarily fit with the reality of what um, you know what the, the story was really like, and um, and I think once you we were saying when we were doing doing these type of things, I'd rather start in a conversation and just. You know, not necessarily always go back chronologically with stuff, you know, and, the, and sometimes with cart fishing books, it's like once you've read a lot of these books, you, you can follow a similar kind of story. And uh, does that does that worry you guys or does that do you notice that? Well, I think just to, to just to hark back briefly to the um, the idea that books are perhaps, you know, uh, they're on their way and that are, there are better ways to consume uh, material like various studies have shown, haven't they, that there's a level of stimulation in the brain that comes from reading that you can't attain from the telly. And that, is that the imagination mu- side You're much it, more guess. passive when you are listening to something or watching something than when you are reading something because you're conjuring, like Sai said, you're conjuring these images. Um, so books are different and, and that sort of physical tangibility of a book I love. I love being able to pick one off the shelf and, and leaf through it and, and the image is often stay with me much much longer than any image that i see on instagram something that like i'm sure like something that gaz ferrum talks about a lot um i hope i'm not stealing his thunder entirely if he ever comes on here but it's uh he asks some when he was teaching he used to ask his class tell me what mm. what was the last thing you saw on instagram and very rarely could they remember what they'd seen that morning 
Whereas with a book, you know, it's burned into our, you know, we remember the pictures, every detail. You yeah. linger over stuff, whereas social media is made for flip, for, for scrolling. Um, yeah, I think social media is, di- yeah, I wouldn't agree on the social media. Like if you say, I think listening to, so- watching someone tell a story that they're passionate about, seeing the emotion in their, hearing it, the emotion in their voice, seeing it, that's what I, I prefer that. Scrolling on social media and that, you don't, you don't get half the, you know, I'd rather read a book than digest uh, everything yeah. on social media because it is, you know, it's seconds, it's gone, it's on to the next. Well, I think, but sorry, just I wanted to jump in with uh, when Tom Stokes came on, I tell people about this all the time. Um, we throw his pictures of his captures up on screen and he's the one guest that I remember who would just, he'd stop and he'd ignore whatever Sai was saying because he was so captivated mm. by what was in front of him and then it take him back to his own memories and that. But I think that's much more powerful personally mm. than... You yeah, know, you could was, see that. You could see He that. was just, his eyes were just locked and on him. You could be talking to him and he was completely yeah. locked he's on He's a bit like you, Al. I get the sense that with Tom, he, he's very... Um, He's not affected by by the by the sort of media and the scene. He's very much a pure animal, like he's wrapped he loves up in it. the captures. Yeah, loves it. Oh, not no. to say that other people don't. No, but that kind of the way that he looks at his captures and stuff. They're not. That's not affected by the fact that the last guy that caught it or whatever or who wrote about it. For Tom, it's a very pure kind of a very pure experience. I think uh, you know. That, um, and he tells a story. So yeah. Certain people, you know, they you, say. But you know, I think that tone as well with Tom, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, he just Fan- he, yeah. Every detail doesn't miss a thing. But if he wrote a book, it might be better than listening to him. I don't on think a it podcast. would be though, would it? No, to I, see don't, I don't think so. Is. No, but when, you, like you say, imagination it depends what you want. Do you want the exact story, maybe how it is, or do you want a bit of imagination? You're going to get that from a book, aren't you? Because you make your own mind up. Like you say, you build your own imagination of what it looks like. And I've done it from books I've read, and I've gone to places that I've imagined. And I've seen them, and you think, "Oh, this is totally <laughs> different." nothing like this. Yeah, what's it, this? Yeah, you know. But I think I think reading a lot of carp fishing, and uh, you know, if you've got if, if someone like Tal brings a new book out, well, you're going to want to read it. I haven't actually. Have you got his new book? I haven't. I have. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Richard's got a signed one. Richard's got a picture in, so inside the on the inside <laughs> yeah. cover. But he signed. It, it those, isn't signed, he? actually. It's not. No. Oh, he was meant to get a signed one. He obviously bought one. Did you buy one? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, Rich Tal offered to give him one, though, didn't you? <laughs> he. he d- yeah. He well, will, yeah. yeah, and I'm sure he will. <laughs> Tell. Tell? <laughs> no, no, no. It, I turned it down because I thought you, you can't, you know, you should buy it. You should buy If someone's done a book, you should buy it. Yeah. So I, I've got the reason to clarify the reason that he offered me one was because there's a couple of my pictures in there. That's all. Right. So, um, which was great. That was enough for me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because Tell's a hero, right? So um, to have a couple of pictures, in fact, one's on the inside cover, I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so I was buzzing with that, yeah. and, and I was happy to pay. In fact, do you know what? I haven't even paid for it. Dan Wildboar bought it because I couldn't get on the site, and I still <laughs> owe him the money. So no one could get on the site. <laughs> that sounded crazy. You, you said he sold out in like twenty-four hours or something, wasn't it? Or it was quick. It was. It was yeah, crazy. It was that day. Yeah, that day. Um, so, so yeah, if the right person writes a book, you know the uh, it, it, you know, you know that this sort of literature is still alive, but. Um, yeah, it's just, I think it doesn't necessarily mean that they're the... The best books aren't written by the guys who catch all the carp. That's, mm. that's period. Mm. You know, one of my, I think one of my favourite books ever, um, Paul Selman's Carp Reflections. Like the stories, you know, Paul was very much documenting the scene around him. He was there and he was part of it, but, but equally he brings, he, he brings, he paints the characters for you. And did he was he top rod? Not always. Like he did pretty well, but he's not seen as one of the great anglers. But I put his book right up there. So if you get a copy, I don't know if you've read it, but if mm. it, it's a it's a cracking read, and it takes you right into the heart of the Con Valley scene in the sort of early nineties, and then reads me a stuff really really atmospheric. And obviously, Paul was a big name, drifted away now. Um, but but I would you know that would be the prime example of not necessarily the guy that caught all the carp, but one of my favourite books. I also think, uh, was it Martin Lawrence's books as well, wasn't it? I haven't read, they the syndicate ones. Yeah, yeah they no, were great. I those. mean, they were fiction, you know, they were fictional books, but they were great stories and they were great fishing stories. And The Myth by Keith Jenkins. I've got that one. That, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you can, um, it doesn't necessarily need to be a, you know, a factual account either. I mean, The Myth and and The Syndicate, you know, it was like, well, you can still relate to it, can't you? It was it, very, very relatable books, but um, yeah, 
but no, they 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 were they they were they were great. But um, mm. I, I like. I think that carp fishing conjures equally vivid stories without them needing to be fiction. So often, I would reach for a for the for the sort of the standard book as yeah. over over the myth, and that's as nice as it is. It, it's got to be real for me, so. <laughs> No, 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 I like that as well. I like her biographical stuff. So, I, I mean, people that you've had on the show, because we could talk all day about different people that we've had on the podcast mm. and people mm. that you've had on Supography. Moments, people in particular that have been on, the, on, on Supography that have sort of stood out for you for any particular reason? I think the pe- people... Oh, that's hard, isn't it? To choose individual people. They're, they're kind of... They all... Sounds you don't want to say that. They all stand out, and, which they do. Um... I remember Dempsey was one of the ones that I felt like I related to the most. Why is that? And he was talking about he was like lived as a feral child. Yeah, like you know, because I that's how I was when I was young. I would happily. Most people are not like that way. They're not. When you think of oh, living at the lake for twi- to most people, their immediate thing is like, no way. Whereas mine isn't. You know, and it wasn't. So he was. I felt like I related to that, and a lot of the time, you know, but. It was the extreme, you know, how extreme the things he was suggesting were, and I know that most people would listen and be like, "No way!" But for me, yeah, I'd have loved to have done that. I'd, He's lived a bit of a life. I'd have done he? anything to be Dempsey's little mate who'd done all that with him. Mm. Do you know? Tony Moore. Yeah. Um, do, you know, do you know the weird thing about this is, Si, there's a kind of justification for what both Elle and I did as kids. I was a geek and read loads, and that's become part of my job. L was a feral child that went fishing and that's become part of his job so actually it all kind of worked out (laughs) it blends nicely together yeah yeah we should uh, we didn't know whether SIP was going to work we we kind of had a feeling that we could make it work because obviously there was a format there was a platform there already Um, but but I was going to say obviously the Alan Blair session you know if anyone could make it work it was Alan He Mm. he remains one of the big characters on the scene and one of the most popular. So to get out with him first was a right coup. We didn't know him either. No. So basically, when we took over Carp TV, because that's what topography was before, it was Carp TV, um, that, this was already booked. So I didn't know Alan. Well, I did, but not, not really. I didn't book this shoot, he put it that way, neither did Rich. So we kind of inherited How did Alan, Alan. feel about that? Well, I knew, I, I knew Alan, but... but uh, I think he was happy to do the shoot. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was happy to he do the shoot. Happy, yeah. because, do you know what? Yeah. Alan is a generous guy. Mm. So I think he, he probably just thought, these guys are setting out, I'm yeah. going to do it. And he didn't come back on very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but he wanted to help out, you know, because that's what Al was like. Al was a lovely guy. Was that, um, was that like episode one? one episode of, one. Yeah, yeah very yeah. first and one, yeah. Like I say, you'd think for episode one, hmm. who are we going to pick? We're going to pick, you know, me and Rich know all these people. So to think that actually the guy yeah, we had on for episode one was someone we didn't even know. We've probably never had someone on since that neither of us knew, but because who was going to book a shoot for us otherwise, mm. you know? But this this shoot, neither of us really knew well, only in passing to say hello, you know? And the way it panned out, and it, you know, Toby can play the clip of doing it, but the, I'd never caught a river carp before, and I caught one here right at the end of a two day, uh, right at the end of a two day adventure, and it was, an did you say this was the uh, the, the wind? Did you say where where was this? Secret location. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say where it is because we've had a bit of stick for it. All oh, right, but okay. It's it's in Essex, um, but we've been on a we've been on a tour of I think we've done a canal. Or I should say canal, lake, I should say river. at this point that Elle isn't the most discerning when it comes to rivers. He he will call a canal a river as well as a, a river. <laughs> well, I hate so it. I don't Anything like Anything that's narrow has got I some hate, sort of honestly, flow to it. I, I hate fishing them. And that's why I never had. I, as soon as I've got my rods out, I'm immediately bored and I want to go because I can see the far bank. And I just, I can't see why it's, I can't see why people would However, it. watch this. Yeah, because, but look um, at this carp. Yeah. So had we seen anything else? No, nothing at a, all. I'll get a shot of him in a sec. How, how did you know what was in the switch? Did Alan? Oh, this is Alan's info. So, so look, I've had a buy it right out the blue. Filming Alan. Great in through all the weed. It's, it's really stuck on something. It's great in bad. Yeah, you can see. I was Thinking. really ill after this shoot because I think I put a lot into it and it and um. Look at it, look. Oh, 
You've cool. all had that feeling oh, where you think yeah, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. Whew, but anyway, and this is our first proper well, shoot as well. So it's yeah, not, this felt really busted. important. It's not just like you're playing a carp on a river, which normally I wouldn't have been that bothered about. Oh. Snagged up down, there's obviously something. But watch water. this. Come on, bruv, come on, bruv, come on, bruv, come on, bruv. And you can see how buzzing Alan is. I yeah, hear is isn't it? Crikey, I mean, that's what... He... Come on. Listen to him. In you go, in you go, in you go, in you go. Yes, first look move at, yeah. look at this carp, mate, in a minute. Give nice me a hug. Give me a hug. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a moment, mate. <laughs> he looks really black. black. He's black. He's a mirror he's as well, black. isn't he? So, d- how, did you, how did you oh, feel well, after this? I mean, has this changed oh, your perception? Still doesn't fish rivers. Oh, no, I still don't fish rivers. But that can't. Fast forward it a bit, Tobe. Is that the last time you fished a river then? Or? Um, Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have been back there, I think, for a night with one of my mates. But if you fast forward to this fish on the mat, like... It's a rare carp. As carp it? go, mate, like, as of all the carp I've caught over the years, Few have looked like this thing. Wait till you see, look at it. Look at it. Right, if that was, look that was probably, belly. I don't know, 16 pound. Yeah. Wait till you see how purple it is on it. Yeah. I've never caught many, yeah. like a carp looks like that before, let alone seen, or seen them either. They're so rare. Look at it, look at the colors in it. It was purple. Look at that color there. Mate, it blew us both it. away. <laughs> Which you've got to get, is that still rolling? Yeah, the purple in its yeah. cheeks. Like, the yellow's on it as well. Like that's, um, yeah. I've got to get some like, take size out of the equation. It's the best carp I've it. ever caught, hands down. And yeah. it's, you know, it's up there with the best I've ever seen. But it's 16 pounds. It lives in a river and it's probably, it's pretty much been forgotten about, you know. But if you'd have chucked that in a lake somewhere and added a bit of oh, weight to it, little you know, <laughs> look at it. Some pretty yeah. special fishing moments this year. It's quite veiny underneath as well, isn't it? It's insane. Yeah. Interestingly, I think. You get that red colour because you've got a lot of capillaries near the surface. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a pretty unscientific kind of take. I'm not sure if it's true. Right. Often those fish have got blood and they bleed at the surface. I've, heard, I've heard some people say that they've got a fish in a net and uh, they do that when they're when they're stressed when they're actually in the net. Look at that, yeah. But this is yeah. yeah. Someone this had, is a wild had, fish. Someone actually yeah. told me they caught this a couple of years later. Look at it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> the little How dip dark in it its back. Is, yeah. It? Yeah. yeah. Old, Doesn't insane. look very impressed, though, does it? Looks no, good, is it? <laughs> no. He's one of the best carp I've ever caught. Beautiful. There you go. He's one yeah. of the best carp I've ever caught. And it was, you know, and it, and it is. Yeah. But it's not. The, but yeah, it's just not very big. Really and unfortunately, really that does have a caught. massive bear on what. Now, honestly, mate, this this is one. Of no, the but that that, that 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 personifies what fishing is all about. Yeah, doesn't that's it? a proper that's what, carp. And yeah. actually, what's what Alan? You know, Alan has made a fish of that size, like finish a show on the bat as high as we could get, like. He celebrates carp of all size. Yes. I can't, I'm not sure that everyone wholeheartedly does, but Alan does. Mm. So. Do you find that with people as well? If you're with someone like Alan, you, ca- you catch something like that, which has got significance to you, but might not necessarily have the same significance to other people. But if you've got that sort of enthusiasm as well, it just people start to get that and sort of understand that as well. It's nice to see, because I'm not like that. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to lie. Like If I catch an 18-pound common... You know, I'm not as happy about that as I would be a bigger fish, you know, rightly or wrongly, I'm not. But someone, some people, like you say, like Alan, he loves every single capture, I think, from what I can make out, as much as the last, whether it's £2, £8 or £50. In fact, I think he caught a, I see a video of him earlier this year, he caught a big carp from the church lake. And I'm sure he didn't weigh it. It was definitely a £40, because <laughs> Jim caught it whilst I was filming with him. And I don't think he weighed it, you know. And I think that, you know, that says he may have done. But he certainly didn't weigh it and put it on his Instagram story, which if he had weighed it, I'm sure he would have. You know, and that shows what he's all about. Who doesn't weigh forty pounders in this day and age? There ain't many people, is <laughs> Not there? Not really, so. no. Talking a big river cup hmm. reflections with uh, with Nick. Yeah, we had him on the podcast. We couldn't get him to talk about that, Tobe, could we? I no, try, I try, I tried to try to get him on the subject. And Nick spoke uh, about what Nick wanted to speak about. <laughs> Like, yeah, uh, well, luckily, <laughs> luckily we're here he because was yeah, vision. unlucky Nick. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know what, Sai? I think I I alluded to before we rolled like that. That's one of the kind of one of my f- the favourite things I've ever made. That film, um, you know, the brief from Sticky was to do a film without product, <clears throat> a film with no reference to the, the corporate aspect, and you know, n- and for that they would they were dead right. You know, Dan Dan Walbo and I met with Nick over the course of 18 months to make that film which obviously it becomes a true documentary then really and most things stand and fall by the characters involved and Nick is everything he says is gold and there's a few <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I can back that up <laughs> there's a few there's a few moments from those shoots that will remain with me and it's not even about the big carp at the end you know it, I remember one morning <clears throat> in October we were 
in the most outrageous part of the Thames Valley because this was all this all took place on the Middle Thames in some epic countryside like the I think Nick said it before this is England you know like this is middle England actually you know this isn't let's let's not beat about the bush this is fairly privileged kind of terrain but we were he was perched on the end of an island sort of in the lee of the flow and we Dan and I had used a sort of saggy dinghy to get out to the to, to where he was moored and it was early um which is unfamiliar territory for me although not so much <laughs> since I've had a little girl now but but it, it was early enough that it was still quite cool and misty and we went out onto the boat and Nick's boat is cool such a cool thing you know when you see one of these boats you need you, you feel like you need to have one but we got out there he put his cafetiere on he had uh, his his little um Bose speaker and he was playing some some Sasha some fairly laid back like um some laid back trans trancy sort of tunes and the, the river was completely flat and the sun was coming up down over over Marlow and um it was one of the most memorable mornings before I'd even picked up a camera there was something in the air it was it was the most chilled vibe I've ever had on a shoot and obviously Nick kind of personifies that isn't it he nothing is an effort for Nick you put the camera on him he talks it's gold you've got like a great film and then fi- and then he catches the big one I mean you couldn't make this up I think from memory <clears throat> Dan and Marcus Howarth were somewhere down south when Nick caught it in the middle of the night got the call and um, they drove up very early morning just as you know got there a couple of hours before dawn broke I think uh, and then obviously he brought ashore I, I, I turned up in the meantime he brought ashore a fish that you know it's not the biggest carp I've filmed it's one of the most impactful carp I've filmed very short Si super short super thick set and in the kind of nick that you know you'd expect a Thames 50 to be um, and, and, and everything you saw from Nick that morning was genuine he was a bit emotional, wasn't he? Yeah, because he'd been through a lot. Um, not long before that, it'd been a tough time. The Thames had been his salvation. And he was, yeah, I mean, he was on the edge of tears. You could see that. When he was holding, he was talking at the end, and he, it, you could see he choked. But yeah. that whole film, have you watched Sex Education on Netflix? No. It's it's filmed in the Y Valley, and it's but it's got the same, it's got the same sort of, ambience to it that that had where you've got those dr- the, those those sort of drone shots looking down through the valley and looking through mm. the river Marlow and you know that reflections film just had that as well like you say you think we're not patriotic enough sometimes and when you look at that you think cracky that's England that's proper He's right. he loves a bit of patriotism doesn't he yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean I don't think we don't film I, d- I don't film documentary like that very often or actuality whatever you want to call it um because it's so hard because you have to have the cameras on the whole time because you want to capture something as it's said but with with nick he gives you so much material that you can craft something out of it in the end anyway whereas with a lot of people you'd miss the moment uh, because we're not machines uh and i did we did our best the thing with filming that kind of stuff is you do your best to capture what happens quite often you fall short and and what you see is the best of what you got because it's never going to happen again so you do your best when they're on the bank you do your best when he's in the moment and then the result is what you you know you cross your fingers and just hope you've got enough and and we did then i think yeah so it was um so it's still officially the the, the biggest te- uh, river carp ever caught y- yeah i don't i don't see that being beaten for There's a while there's been few captures i would say that i've ever seen that caused that much of a but but I think it was the fish itself. As I, well. It made it was so the, impactful though. Not not the, take the film out of the equation. The capture itself. It's been a long time since a capture has rocked the world like that did. Like that was in you know p- people catch fifty pounders all the time. They catch love you know beautiful. Car- but that carp, the 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 impact that had on the fishing scene was massive. And I haven't I have don't I doubt it will. It will be a very 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 long time until a. Another capture has that same effect. Yeah, had all the ingredients. Um, so the brief was. So you were going to keep filming until you, it, he hopefully caught no, that. No, or? no, no, uh, no. We we were p- fully prepared to wrap with one decent carp. 
That's, that needs to... Because he caught a 30-pounder on there He as caught well, an incredible 30. Mm. Yeah. And, quite, and why I didn't rap with that, I'm not sure. Maybe we felt there was more to come. Maybe we just knew. Oh. But, yeah, no, the, the, um, the, the brief was to just get a flavour of what it was like to live, to live the dream on that boat. Rap with, with one of the... Because there, are, there were several nice carp on that stretch. Um, and, yeah, one or two would have been a, enough. And we'd filmed a couple on a different part of the river earlier in the summer, so we had you know plenty of sort of backup material. But you know nobody saw that coming. I think I think Nick started to get the sense that he was close, and hopefully you can pick that up in the film. It's one of my favourite parts of that film when when we st- when the sort of tempo shifts a little bit, and and, he, and he's telling a, the story about how it beca- how it started to unfold, and how he he felt like he was getting close, and his descriptions of that carp you know a pretty you know pretty evocative um and and i will say that you know and and rightly so that the freedom that we were given by sticky to do those films whether it's the nick one you know the 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 stuff we did with yatesy um that's got you know for for me that's gold because that's what i want to do and and we'd love to do more with sit but you know you have to remember with topography we haven't got a year to turn a film around and and Nick's was 18 months in the inception that just you know we probably will do more of that sort of stuff I'm sure we'd like Mm. to but you know we don't have unlimited resources and neither did Sticky but it was but they certainly had time to throw at it and and we don't quite have that but we'd love to bring more of that stuff but then you also need to remember that circumstances conspired to 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 make him catch the biggest carp in the river ever and we were available to do to do it. I mean, you couldn't write it, so si. no. Um, and and I don't know how I beat that as a bit of documentary about fishing. So you, you had you had everything. All the pieces were in place there. You know, I think it is as well. We're, I've never been river. I've been river fishing in France, but I've never really got that to be honest. But when you're filming something like that with a river, I mean, it's evolving all the time. It's, it's more dynamic, isn't it? You're not, it's not watching somebody set on the same place. To be fair, that's a proper river as well. Like, I've been there since. Yeah. And like, when I say I don't like rivers, they're boring. You look across, that's a, that big, slightly bigger river, a bit more going on. That, tap, that's a different. Tap clear. Yeah, like I could, I could get into that, I think. If the reward is there, you know, if a carp like that was soon around. The yeah. river <laughs> and the, what was Nick, so Nick off camera after that. So what was his reaction Nick, Nick, there is no Nick off camera. Like, there isn't, Si. Like, what what I filmed of him, let's say right at the end, <clears throat> one of my favourite bits, it's, it's a bit rough. Like, we were on the boat, boat's moving about, I'm on the shoulder with the camera, trying my best with, with a lens that probably was a, wasn't quite wide enough. And uh, Nick's in and out the shade. So it's true actuality, you know, that I, I'm not really prompting him and he's talking about his, how it's, you know, how it feels after it's gone back. That is as true to Nick that's as true to the moment as you're going to get um, Nick on camera and Nick on, off camera is the same thing he's very good at expressing and himself that, that is <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell you how rare that is I don't yeah. think there's another person like Nick uh, I don't think there is uh, because most people who are skilled in front of a camera have developed a skill and are great presenters which means they modify their behaviour uh, they're not the same person on screen as they are off screen Nick is the same and and I think that's mm. super rare mm. I mean maybe you get 2% more Nick but mm. it's not a lot it's not noticeable there's, um, so, there's so many layers to him as well isn't it I mean he's he's obviously like remember at the end of this tape when we filmed the um, the podcast with him yeah. and he was talking about was it those salmon sharks in um, in America where he wanted a fish that's it? it yeah and <laughs> it, it, his, his, his enthusiasm was just off he of was, the he, scale he was he, he was jumping up and down yeah. talking about these fish and, you know, he's not even fishing for him, but just, just, just... No, and, uh, and you know, he talks about, you know, potentially one day moving to New Zealand and that would be such... I mean, I'd be gutted. Like, Nick, uh, you know, I count Nick as a friend, but more importantly, one of the biggest characters that, that you could have on a scene and it would be the poorer for that. I hope he doesn't do it. So, you know, talking about characters um, and of a slightly more controversial character that pops up on Sepography. I know you're good friends with him, yeah. Jim Shelley. Yep. Um, did you know Jim very well? Mm, kind of, kind of. Mm, I did, but not very well. Not like I do now. 
Right. Know, I knew him. I don't even know how I met him, to be honest. I really can't remember how I met him. Uh, but no, I didn't know him that well. You no. used to send him tackle when we were here. Yeah, was that so? Yeah, I remember buying a book off him once. Went down there in my missus' little car. She had like a smart car. He couldn't believe his eyes. Called it the Nugget McBill. Uh, r- ripped the shit out of me for a while on text about that. Then that, I lost contact of him. You I've, know, I, I've, sorry, I've never read that book actually. But you said that. I mean, he he couldn't read or write, and he learned to read so and write, Rich, and then ended up um, writing a book as well. Was it the sec- Was his first book or second book that you did? That he- his uh, second book I sort of wrote with him yeah um, albeit it ended up just being editing because Jim taught himself to read and write during that period that, that we think we sat down memory serves me right we sat down at Waveney and he had he handed me a bunch of papers so he'd, he'd learnt to write and, and it was on A4 by the time we finished that book he was sending over word processed documents that were all to all intents and purposes like a normal person you know should would, would would submit um and it was a fairly intense kind of like year or so working on that uh, and actually jim and i lost touch after that entirely until we started working for photography mm. again i think we just kind of but bear in mind when when i worked at, on acf jim was um one of our best paid regulars so i'd spent oh, five years there and then another cut another couple of years say so, I don't know let's say six solid years working with Jim almost every month and I think that both of us kind of you know we just didn't feel the need to pick up the phone anymore which was fine you know Jim got on with his stuff I got on with mine and the mm. next time it's uh, our sort of we've like flipped roles now haven't we yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah that that just I don't I remember the main the, the, the main reason I wanted to do that was because I thought we'll get, I can get good content out of Jim you know I can get whether you like him or not, he is he is who he is. But I knew that there would be a, you know, there would be something about him that people would love, you know. Um, as much as there was lots of stuff about it that people didn't, you know, there's there's a Jim has a passion and a thing that lots of people do not have, and he 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 gets it across in a very strange way. He's the weirdest person I've ever filmed with. You know, he just he leads the shoot himself. You don't even have to really, you have to try and. It's hard. You have to stop him a lot of the time, you know. But he's like, point the camera at me, do this, you know, get this, get that. You don't get that from someone. Bear in mind, he's hardly ever been filmed. Um, but you know, he is like, he loves car. He is as pure a carp angler as you're ever, ever gonna meet anywhere in the world. You know, from everything, from how much he obsesses over seeing a carp, how much he cares for them when they're on the bank, how much he wants to be at the lake every, you know, every living second of his existence so many things that very very good anglers and very very passionate anglers have Jim has all of those things and quite often people have some of those things and I'll say that on for a, a few anglers you know some of the all the best anglers that that I've ever f- fished with worked with whatever however you want to put it they all have certain things about them but they have all the all the boxes are ticked you know and their drive is is his angling style? I mean, is it a lot different to, you know, a lot of the top anglers that you see? Or no, like I think I would say Daryl and Jim are the best anglers that I've personally ever been around. Um, I spent a lot of time very close to Daryl, and I spent a lot of time m- more recent years close to Jim. And it, it is their obsession and their want just to see a sign. You know, it's easy to get up early once. It's easy to stay up late once. But like I remember being in Belgium with Daryl, he set an alarm for two o'clock in the morning, start cycling around the lake at two o'clock in the morning on his bike in the middle of the night. You know, it's not easy to do that. It's easy to want to do it, and it's not easy to do that two, three, four times in a row. You know, it's not easy to get up before first light every day, five days a week. You know, it all boils down to their approaches are very, are very simple from what you know what I can make out. See a carp and cast them a lot of the time, which couldn't be any simpler, could it? But when you go head to head with someone like that, you know I've come home from shoots with Daryl, just thinking, I don't know how you do that. And the same, with, and it's the same with Jim. And I'm sure I think it's probably the same with a lot of the very, very best anglers. They just want it more than most right. people do. Jim Shelley seems to sort of flip between venues. I mean, he could be fishing multiple different yeah. venues in one day, can't he? He won't stay somewhere. So we've we've filmed. Oh, we've been we've got a film coming out of him. I think it's to but this week anyway. We were filming this. I've been down to film him um, and he's got a camera so he can document his own stuff and he'd been there two or three weeks in a row 
and then he texts me, he's like, I've gone home, basically. And he'd seen, there's only 15 car up in the lake. He'd seen them showing in front of another guy on the opposite bank. And rather than just like wait 24 hours and see if, they, he just left. He left, he said, I can't be, I can't get on him, can't be near him. And the guy caught the, the, the one he wanted to catch, that guy opposite, caught it that day. So, he, but he'd left the lake to go somewhere else rather than spend any more than another couple of hours watching these fish and not be able to get to them, you know. And that's quite a weird, it's a very, you know, you have to be a certain kind of person to be like, I have to go and find another opportunity somewhere else. But not I mean, that's how, that's how much he understands the situation in front of him, isn't of it? If he, if he, if he, you know, if he's that convinced that I need to be fishing somewhere else after that. The thing is, though, so si, a lot of us would have stayed and just have been happily sat behind rods trying out. to catch a car, yeah. one of the others. But for, for him, it was wasted time. Right, and he was on them every morning. It wasn't like I was talking to him. He was on them the morning before and the morning before that. It wasn't like they were always over there. But as soon as they were over there, gone. Because there's only 15 carp in the lake. And he's thinking, well, they're there. I'm going. Like, By the way, I, I think just this, without jumping off Jim too soon, it's put me in mind of the recent stuff we've done with Ian Russell. Like, I'd, I've known Ian for years. Like, he was a big character <clears throat> on the scene when I started in the trade, on the magazines. And I think he's been ever-present in Total Carp ever since. I've known him for a long time. I've never worked with him because he was always in Total. I was in ACF. He was never at Corder when I was here. That guy, I've never seen... And bear in mind, I've, I've worked with Jim. I, you know, Jim's clearly on, on, a, on a, a very, very high level, the same sort of level as Ian. Ian is the most... Um, dynamic angler I've ever seen fish I've never seen somebody do as much as he does I've never seen that oh well, his work rate and that just yeah, doing stuff yeah the whole time. almost annoying if you're trying to film yeah, it he's put almost <laughs> yeah. so you hard to film oh, really <laughs> in the end you just let him do it and, we, and you don't film it. it nobody he moves so quick I mean bear in mind uh, you know Ian's late 50s he is on it on his toes same as Jim mm -hmm. I remember I remember vividly but doing a day's float to fishing with Jim over the wool pack I find it hard to keep up with Jim when he's yeah. barrowing never mind like yeah. film the guy he's quick mate over the ground for a big guy and the kit he takes the barrow he has with him like a lot of kit oh more, more kit than any angler I know by a mile I would say like a lot more kit than anyone I know and anyone I've ever gone out with and filmed either However, it, so much stuff and he but doesn't climb a tree either no, Jim's never climbs a phenomenon trees. he stands yeah. and he I remember he started fishing a lake uh, my friend Dave was fishing um, and this was just before I started talking to Jim again. And it was actually through Dave that it ended up happening. And I remember Dave ringing me. He was like, Jim's here. And he rung me three hours later and he was like, he is not moved. <laughs> he was like, he ain't moved. And like, you could, if, you could, if I could record Dave's voice in this phone call, he was, he was, Dave was sitting opposite him and just Jim standing at the front of the swim was wearing Dave down. Because you know? Jim just standing there. And I was like, what do you mean he's not moving? He's like, he's just standing there, mate. He's got an umbrella, it's rained, and he ain't moved. He's, he goes, he doesn't even look the other way. He just stands there. And, what, and when you talk, when, you st when you're at the lake with Jim, he doesn't like to look away from the lake. He doesn't want to, you know, he does, obviously, but he doesn't want to be looking away from the lake. If you do a bit to camera with him, he wants to be facing the lake. His eyes, it's, and his, his, you know, his body, everything is looking at the lake. So you, everyone's like, lined up looking out into the distance then, it's, aren't they, when it's you're so talking hard to it's such a simple thing if I said to you right yeah, just stand there for, for three or four hours and if a carp shows you're going to see it I guarantee you you can't do that you can't because it's, it's like I'm looking at my phone within ten minutes yeah you can't do it but that's how simple it is and like I say Daryl's the same you know the, the, do you, the very best that they, but they want nothing more than to see whereas it's not like that and, for everyone and reputedly um, Tom Banks is the same. I think Daryl wrote about yeah. it, didn't he? In the book, the fact that he would get Daryl would was almost embarrassed into getting up because mm. he'd wake up, and as as dawn broke, Tom was stood in the water in his wade and has been for hours, like not moving, just looking out, very gym like looking. And out that's what lake. will happen to you, you know. Like say, if you spend time with that sort of person, you go home thinking, Jesus, I'm not like, doing enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not doing, and, but if you fish the same lake as them, when you go to another lake where there isn't that kind of guy there. It doesn't matter as much, Phew. but if there is that kind of guy there, you have you have you have to, you know, if you want to be in the mix with them, you that's that's the sort of thing you have to do. Have you have you been able to learn much from, um, you know, from following him around? No, not really. No, no, I've learned. I haven't. 
No, and the same with Daryl. You don't learn that much. You just learn that their their it's, drive is is it isn't what they. You know, Daryl's a great caster. He's very accurate. But lots of people have those things. What certain people have, like Daryl and Jim, is is a is something you can't fake. You can't ma- you can't um, you can't learn to be like that. You know, you can't you can't make yourself be like that. You either are or you aren't, and they are. It's in there. It's in there. Yeah. But Penn, in, Penn, Penners, I'd say Penners has like over the last in recent years, he's caught a lot of carp. And if you ask Adam Penning, from what I can make out, what I've seen on social media, etc., what's the thing that changed your fishing? He just what's it optical calories? Does he call mm. it watching? Watching, you know. So, but uh, there's a challenge for he's anyone out there. Different, Try and watch the water. Different phase for, for something, hasn't he? A, a, a yeah. Different, yeah. <laughs> but there isn't a crazed like science to it. It's no. just put. It's motivation. Put yourself and in those positions, and the best way to get in those positions is to watch. El, El mentioned the be- or it might be new site that mentioned the, the Belgium shoot. Um, uh, with Daryl and Dan and actually that was probably among the first times we properly filmed together else it, yeah. it has got relevance and and we we bowled over to Belgium Dan had decided that that we would try and do masterclass in house which was unheard of like you usually got in the freelance TV guys with all the kit and mm. and me and El bowled over to Belgium with like a couple of tiny Nikons yeah. and and like a couple of power packs to try and film you know these guys and I think it's probably still it's quite a popular film. One of my favourite yeah. films we've ever made, hundred um, percent. But but generally, you know, you're getting woken up by Dan or Daryl with a coffee in the morning. That's they, they are on it, and you know, you've got to rig up and try and go toe to toe. I mean, he, I think you. you I always was, was always with Daryl. I think da- and I think Daryl fishing with. If you, I'm sure if you ask Dan, fishing with Daryl changes your. Mate, you can't go. You cannot go fishing on a shoot with Daryl. And if you're not willing to do those things, because he'll just make you just made look to look an idiot, like you look, you look lazy, like if you don't. Mm. But you can easily go home and start fishing your other lake, and and then not do those it's things. It's not there anymore. No, yeah. all of a sudden, yeah. Uh, before we move on, so I do want to just I, I kind of listening to myself in my own head as we're doing this. I I do you know I kind of feel a little bit like the the section on Nick kind of felt a little bit like I was making a documentary. I should point out that that. Dan Wildball was every bit as important to that as I was. You know, we we shot together really well as a team, and I, I still shoot to, with Dan to this day, or have done loads over the years. We work so well together, so I can't really let that slide without without you know um, giving Dan a right old shout out because you know he's he was fifty percent of that operation. Mm. Um, but but you know, as we were in Belgium, El, you know, mm. but that that was a, a proper grounding for us. But the Belgium shoot. It was brutal. It we was were running out of battery well, the whole time, though, weren't we? It was we? fun. It was just like that was a proper lake with proper carp, good anglers. You know, it was just. And, and ever and since it was then, exciting because we hadn't made that kind of film before. Ever since well. then, quarter of shot masterclass in house. Ever since mm. that shoot, right? Mm. That, um, they don't pay for freelance to come and do masterclass. Anymore. Yeah, it was all SLR after that, wasn't it? Because of how and, you know the low. And do you remember it, um, Dan? The, Dan said he was going to cater for us, oh, yeah. um, and he regretted it within the first twenty-four hours because, that, because you know how active Dan and Daryl are on a shoot. Dan settled down to fish, and we ate a beautiful steak at midnight yeah. on the first, <laughs> first night. Or yeah. getting on, but it was like ten thirty midnight. Oh, Daryl, it was in blue them them plastic rolls in the blue bag. Yeah. And, and hot dogs and he could have had anything he wanted but that was it because that took the least time to but Dan quickly realised that him catering for yeah, the film crew wasn't going to have legs because he had to fish as well <laughs> but yeah well I mean Dan's just as passionate as anybody isn't he and um, I guess it goes to show as well that you know like enthusiasm and passion you know that can actually override and this is what so many like this is the big th- over the thing with Jim the big thing with Jim, the amount of people I've had message me and just say that your films with him have completely, not everyone, but lots and lots and lots of people have said that the films we've done with him have just completely changed there. And that is all because of the passion that he has for, and when you love, if you love fishing and you see another guy who clearly just loves fishing, you, you're inspired by that. You, you? you feel a sense of responsibility, don't you? We with with, with the shows, you you feel like you're you're trying to humanise that person as much as you possibly can. And mm. um, if they if they leave this stuff and you know and they're disappointed, it's like, well, I haven't I haven't done a good good enough job, you know, in 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 achieving that. So it's um it's it's very important as well. You don't always get you don't get second chances either, do you? Sometimes so. Mm. 
No. That's, that's, that's one thing I said is the time the fish are on the bank. That's one noticeable thing about filming with Jim. You say about not getting a second chance. You're talking a couple of minutes. Really? People think that, that everyone has their carp out of a couple of minutes. I can assure you they don't. Most people that have a fish on the bank, it's a lot longer than they... But not many people have um, the, the care for a fish that I've seen that he has. That's quite, that is quite rare. Mm. Yeah. If it, I think if it, if it all stopped tomorrow and Jim couldn't make another penny out of fishing, he'd still be every bit as passionate about it as it is. Mm. I think that's something that, that people mm. miss. The guy mm. bleeds fi- carp fishing. He, he is a phenomenon in that sense. Mm. And what you guys do as well, I mean, you're catching, catching special moments. And, um, you know, I can think of, you had Luke Stevenson catching Colin. Yep. And Luke Stevenson's another one. I mean, I didn't know anything about Luke until mm. he came on uh, Sopography. And I mean, he's quite a cool guy. I know yeah, he's a good he mate is, of yeah, yours, yeah. isn't he? He's, and, he? and he's a cool guy. And he, you know, he... He, co- he sort of looks the part, doesn't he? And you know, and 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 following him and hearing that story when he caught when he caught Colin died last Which is, week. It wasn't died, it? unfortunately. Yeah, but have you got you've got the footage of that in your table? Yeah. Like, yeah. That was a, a such a shame. You know, don't want to sit here and dwell on the whole otter thing. We all we all know that, that it's a, uh, you know, we all know what the crack is now with otters. But you know, you see carp like that. Look at my boxes; they're cool, aren't they? <laughs> Very nice, yeah. What, the the Calvin um, Kleins? The red ones, yeah. (laughs) That that carp is such a great carp. Yeah. Massive as well. Yeah. Like, it was heavy, 51 pounds. I'm not sure it looks better. Such a big frame. Never looked better than that. No, I think think you're right. Look, bizarrely, Dan and I were filming with Gaz Ferrum and Marcus Howarth down the road. That's why Elle's in the shots and not filming it, because Dan and I were able to come over and... and, um, I was at the North Met, I think, and I'd spoke... I was at the North Met... And I was, yeah. I was on the phone to Luke the night before, and weirdly he'd caught pretty, he'd caught pretty much every carp from the lake at this point, um, and he put a bottom bait on that night on the spot. First time he'd done it. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. he we were we were talking about that as you would do, you know. He'd got his rods out for the evening, and we spent the evening talking about what I'd seen at the Met, which was pretty much nothing, and what he'd seen there, which I don't think it was a weird night. It was like um, drizzling rain, very you know a typical big carp night, but. It wasn't he, in Cambridge. I think it was bl- beautiful. Blue. Was it? Yeah. yeah, where I was, it was like it had atmosphere. Um, but he caught, yeah, he caught that on the on the bottom bait rod that he was, and he was freaking out about yeah. it because you can imagine he feels like he's close to catching it. He's caught everything else, and then he changes what he's doing, which is a big thing to do. Six, which one, four? But come the morning, that's kind of what he needed to do in the end, wasn't well, it? It, it? You know, you know, change, change something. Maybe, it, maybe it didn't make a jot's worth of difference, but it probably did. You know, somehow. <laughs> Do you find, that guys, is, you know, it's is important to, to introduce That'll these type of, you know, kind of underground anglers, you know, a bit more to the public? It's as part well. of the fun of having, you know, having our own. Um, and do you know what? Weirdly, it's something Hello, that doggy. people often ask is, oh, why don't you get guys? That, the public seem to love guys they're not, you know, they don't, they've not heard of. Of course, you know, if you get the big dogs on, you put Tom, Tom Dove on there, you have massive viewing figures but actually they also really like a guy that they I think they relate to them more um and guys like Luke you know they relate to them because they're they don't maybe don't know them as well do do you guys good anglers too do do you guys know many people like that 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 are not that sort of media savvy at the moment which um who 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 would potentially we said about Tom Stokes because since Tom's done this i mean he's he's, he's working for corda now mm. so so pleased for him by the way so yeah I, it's the best yeah I, yeah I hit you know i've 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 seen the odd comment about you know a bit of bitterness towards tom or a bit of like taking taking the piss out of him for you know for uh for taking for stepping over into the corporate world of fishing but that kid is like living the dream he's a great ambassador for the sport one of the best yeah. storytellers we've got and loves it and and for someone to to take time to like take the piss out of him for Taking a job at you know a, a place like Corder, I, I'm sorry, that's like a load of shit. He said living the dream to me. Like I've spoke to him a few times since he took this Corder role. I don't know how many times he said living the dream, but he, like Rich just said, he's living the dream and he's fully aware. You know, you can tell how much he appreciates it because he can't stop saying it. I'm living the dream. I'm living Ooh. the dream. What are you doing this week, Tom? Oh, I'm living. The, yeah, I'm going fishing all week. Living the dream. He'll sign off of it all the time, and rightly so because. Well, he is, isn't he? And 
did you guys say you got some exclusive video there? If, if, yeah, if, well, um, cool. if Tom with the uh, birth nope, so that's, looks like that's the, the baby, baby black. black. Go, so go back. So go back again, Tobes. I got so I got a little bit of. If we're talking Burfield Common, you know, again, one of the fish that that, that I've been privileged to see. Um, I've seen a few great UK carp and and been you know privileged to photograph them and stuff. There's a few that I would like to have seen, so si, you know, but but this is one that I was able to see and. Um, it's always tough to kind of get a perspective on them when you're behind the lens. You never, it never settles in in the moment. But, but, I mean, there's a lot more of this fo footage, and um, well, I mean, you can look see at the head on it. It's just too look at the mouth it. on it. I mean, you could put your yeah. easily put your fist through that mouth. It's just, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's only a, it's, a, it's a little clip because I don't know. I'd like to think that sometime you know we'd find a way of using that footage. Um, but it was great to be there, and there were loads of lads there. Tom was, you know, well, you've had the story, so. It's like the baby black thing. There's, there's more footage that we've got of him with the baby black. We'd, I think he was like, he was he was deep into his campaign, hence why we thought, right, we need to do this soon because he's probably going to catch it. And uh, we went down to see him for a couple of days, and long story short, we left the lake. We spent two days with him. He caught, I think he caught on the second morning. Um, we left the lake, went up to see Johnny Mack at Dinton, and we'd only been out of his swim for, I don't know, an hour, and he he had the bite from the baby black. But again, you mentioned how good a storyteller he is, and that this was one of those films where he was he was he wanted to catch that carp so 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 much, and in the interview we did with him, he's just pouring out of you. You can see. You, look, you know, you could Coffee see how much he wanted to catch it, and he did, you know, which could not have been a better ending for us yeah, yeah. or him, really. Yeah, and you were supposed to be doing this over quite a long yeah, period yeah, as well, no, weren't no, you? No, and I mean, no, <laughs> we'll just try yeah. it. this was going to be the first, um, the the first part of him, you know, building up to catching <laughs> the baby black. But again, if you if you watch the film with him, there's little things where he and he's like, I just hope I catch it. We're not asking him to say him, but he he constantly reminded himself of how much he wants to catch it. And he keeps doing it on camera. So you have to watch it to, to, <laughs> to really get it. There you go, look, his Most scales have been set right. on fire. And because the carp was so big, they were melted at the point where really? normally the dial That's doesn't what get happens. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He needs a nice new pair of quarter scales now, doesn't I'm he? I'm sure, and I'm sure he's probably. Well, I don't know if he's got a pair, but if you fast forward it a bit, Toe, just hoist, just to get him. Um, so we were we were we were out with Tom last week, um, and he's still got those scales and he's he still, still got, got that hat. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah. The, the hat will never go no, the hat's unless in his he bag. loses it. No, the hat's in his bag because it was too cold. He had to put a beanie on, but but he's still got the scales with the melted face yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, Tom Tom probably is literally the sort of guy that we would use all the time. Hunt, yeah. Yeah, um, he's he's right. What's where Sip needs to be, I think. Mm. Yeah, he, yeah, he's the epitome of like the perfect guy for what we like the films we like to make. Very good angler, great storyteller. He looks cool, doesn't he? You know, the <laughs> as a guy, a, a good and ambassador for, for for topography as well. Fishing, like, he's a good like ambassador a, for fishing. Yeah, side, exactly. You know, yeah. if, if if everyone was like him, you you know, it'd be a pretty good place. Like. Yeah, there's no, there's no. I think perhaps there's not an ounce of bitterness or jealousy ever that I get with Tom. <coughs> Nothing. So going, at, actually, Rich, you said just, something there. I was just so. going to say, it's just that smile, isn't it? He loves it, doesn't yeah. he? And he giggles when he tells he a story. He loves. And I he loved does. it when he yeah. did that. On yeah. Our and yeah. At the end of this, <laughs> I'll go forward it to the end. There's a bit at the end where I think he just kind of. Just signs off. He swears a little bit at the end, but there you go. But playing that, you'll see. Is just, and, and that's what you want to see when you film someone. You, that's why. You, that's why you're there, isn't it? To see them. Crikey, he's, and, he's excited when he was here. I mean, crikey, God, God, his, his blown. His brain must be blown to pieces there, mustn't it? Every time he catches something like that. Absolutely. There you go. Happy fucking days. That's what he said. Yeah. Now, out of interest, in terms of carp you filmed, where does that sit? It's always a weird one. That I, it was never a carp that I really liked until I saw it. I'd always wanted to see it, so it was one of those big carp that uh, I'd always seen pictures of, and I'd be like, "Oh, I'm not sure if I like its mouth or its head or its." 
but that on the bank the colors of that fish you know that was an impressive so is that is that your number one then no it's not my number one so what's your number one what i've seen on the bank yeah dustbin i've mm. seen i've seen dust yeah probably dustbin from the car what about like, films what about can you remember filmed do you know what it is no oh uh it's film. an easy one for me <laughs> The, the, the BC, isn't it? I, I think. think actually, the, 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 my favourite car park I've actually filmed is probably the common Jimmy Armstrong court, and I've brought oh, yeah. footage of that. Yeah, I would. Mm, yeah, I would say yeah that. Why was that then? Because it it looked like it, I'd never seen it, which is very rare. So normally, ninety five percent of the car that I see, either some even if someone else catches them and I'm not there, I've still seen them before. You know, because I'm a, I'm into my car fishing a lot. It's not often you see a carp, especially a big carp, that you've not seen a picture of before. Can I just interject and say that if you'd been monitoring the Corda website during your working days here, you'd have noticed <laughs> yeah. that we ran a news story about yeah. this fish, and it was like £42. Pound. Um, Apparently it died, though, hadn't it? They said that as well. Was that right? Did they? they yeah. That was the rumour. But this carp, like, I hadn't seen it before, and to that, that's quite a big thing, you know, if you saw the lake. So we basically, we were filming with John Mack, we were at Junction 12. It was absolutely dog shit. Nothing was happening. Middle of November, Jimmy rings me on a, you know, middle of November morning, and he tells me he's got this a massive comment. It was before light, L, wasn't it? But yeah, I remember it was you leaving. Dark. I was yeah. still in bed. It, yeah, it was still dark, but I think I was up. I don't think it was like middle of the night. It was early morning. So we got in the we got in the car. Me and Dave. Uh, I've left the shoot. So obviously we're fil- I'm supposed to be fishing so I've cranked my rods in monster, we've mate. just canned that off long, and we've gone up to this lake and it's a big lake I think 1900 acres and he pulls this carp out like, yes. it, it looked to me like a carp that should be but in Belgium or Germany right. or something. it didn't look like an English carp it was look. just this, its head its shape uh, mate God. that was a you know that is a mental mental fish one thing I want to say Si as well when you look at this footage and it's, and it's the same with a lot of these things that the way that we cut this, or the way that specifically Elle has cut this footage, it, we've left a lot in there. Um, you would cut this down. You could cut this down to a segment of shots, but the way SIP works mm. is we like to leave yeah, as much whole natural bank. sink in as yeah. possible. And then if that, if that means there's a few moves that pr- aren't the prettiest, doesn't matter. That's not what we're trying to do. Mm. But you, you, you get the realism of it, don't you? And, uh, I think that's the key. Yeah, yeah so many fish, yeah. you just all of a sudden they're just up, they're held for 10 seconds, and then yeah, they're Yeah, they, they, can, they can look like we'll still pictures that don't necessarily... We want to keep as much of the, yeah. the going, you know, the weighing, both sides, all look of at it. I've, no, I've only just noticed it's got... It's, the, the nares are, are on the outside. Yeah. Which are, I've caught a carp like that, but Have only you? one, yeah, ever. You just noticed that? You, I'd never, I didn't notice yeah, it before. Yeah, you see the, 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 the old Mate, factory sacks are on the outside of the... I know it's a common. A lot of people go, oh, it's a common, you know... And yes, there's no denying that mirrors are better than commons, I suppose, <laughs> you know, but... Oh, you're going to get so but, many bad comments No, I'm now. not. If I'd, have said it, if I'd have said it the other way around, maybe, but, you know, but look at this car. Look at the head on it and that. It's just like those lips. It yeah. bear in mind, this is £49 or something as well. 48 something, was 48, it? 48. Yeah, yeah you know. that, that, that underslung mouth as well. It's just, yeah, it's, mate, yeah. I've seen a lot yeah. of carp and that, that's a nice carp isn't it that's that, a lovely yeah. carp the head is something else but if you were there yeah. you know, the you're watching the footage yeah but if you were there on that day well seeing done. it in the flesh is so different to seeing it on the you know seeing it in footage mate oh, and it was a park lake so there were people you know there were, these old ladies yeah. turned up Blow whilst they had it on the bank you know we kept all that yeah. footage in there they were yeah, the, yeah they didn't know what was going on and neither did we and that's you know and that's why that capture for me, will always probably yeah, that'll be the favourite carp I've filmed. Look at it, <laughs> Rich. I got a feeling that yours might be a common as well. Is that right? I was going to say mine's easy, isn't it? I've seen lots of, what well, I mean, I've seen lots of big carp on the bank. I um, but yeah, I mean, the Burfield Commons are shoe in. I, I remember, it, albeit not filmed, I I was actually there when long time carper Dave Moore caught the caravan park linear for the second time because he was actually fishing that lake for a fish that he thought was you know another big one like a big common or something and we'd we'd, we'd met for a feature sat in cambridgeshire um really intimate little lake very difficult to get on especially at that time um dave's well connected in that area and a top man and i'd gone out i was shoot, in fact it was it may even have been for my very first issue as editor of acf anyway so we 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 we, we tipped up at this lake um, we weren't there to shoot anything remotely sort of like angling centric so I just watched Dave we walked to the end of this point and he just lowered a, um, a rig in with two 12 millers against the bush a couple of pults of 12 millers and we just retired up the bank to do the, to do our shots and I think from memory it was a feature about like 
it was like I think it was called Essentials, and it was just like, what are the ten things that you don't go fishing um, without? Halfway through that, it's ripped off, and um, I watched Dave. So from from placing the rig to landing the fish, land a, what was probably his scales were wrong at the time, bizarrely, but it was probably a fifty five pound linear, um, and photoed it for him. And obviously, he'd already caught it, so it wasn't like a kind of we didn't celebrate it in the set in the way that he probably would have done first time round. But I did get a couple of shots, which I don't have. And I, and I, I hope that if Dave ever does his book, which I think he's written, I don't know, um, that, that he got, he's got one of the shots because I got a shot of it. Complete fluke. You know, you take a lot of photos. He's playing this fish. He's waded out into snaggy back bay and, and this linear's hit the surface dorsal, like a flag. You can see the huge plates coming out the water. Um, could only be that fish. And yeah, he went on to land that. But that, I mean, that's probably one of the better, the better mirrors I've seen. Yeah, yeah, um, that was a lovely carp. Uh, Why did you say his scales were wrong? Uh, because he'd D- listen. Dave doesn't. Dave is not into weights, like in the sense that he's not kind of someone that's going to be like, oh, it was. F-. He didn't care that it was fifty three. It was fifty three when he caught when we weighed it, and he he found out afterwards that several fish because he'd been fishing Chad home pool at Chad Lakes for, for Black Eye Black at the time. Eye, yeah, yeah. And he'd caught several of those fish three pound down. And ch- and I think he caught Black Eye and it was three pound down. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until then that he realised there might be something wrong with his scales. And, and this was after that we'd weighed the, the caravan part linear that he'd kind of come to this realisation that something might be wrong. So we'll never know. It might have been a 55 pounder. It might have been a 50. It was certainly a 53. So <laughs> I'm not going to not gonna split hairs on that one. It was, it was a great fish to see. Although like all these things it flashes by in an instant and it was back and I, and I don't really have a good memory of it other than you know maybe the odd the picture that we ran in the magazine at the time you know these things are so fleeting which is why it's nice now to be able to watch it back rather than just kind of rely on your shonky memory yeah yeah um yeah that, that, there's something to be said for that if you guys had to go back to a certain period and film uh, an edition of sapography a certain capture which one oh, would it be oh, oh, oh. Oh, i mean so we did, we haven't even talked about Yatesy. Yatesy's capture of the bishop. I mean, I don't want to monopolise two, but it's between that and Terry's capture of the Black Mirror for me. Yeah, the bishop's legendary, isn't it? It's um, you know how he caught it and stuff. And I mean, uh, to imagine to film the fight. So yeah. like, you know, John Carver's waded out and got stuck in the silt, and and the fish has grounded itself because it's so big, and he's they're having to kind of drag and scoop at the same time, and it comes in like a black pig rolled in the mud and then yet you know yet he runs off and throws his hat across the field like you know just the irony of that as well you had all those anglers around the lake that were modern carp anglers at that time and you had this guy there that was fishing the way chris did and he was the one that managed to catch it mm. so, I mean, a fish that he'd caught before um yeah yeah but but even so and i think as he says it was a different carp you know deep sort of purples and reds and black along the back i mean People say it's a spawn-bound fish. Uh, they did at the time, but I, I think in today's parlance, I see fish like that all the time. Yeah. That's just a that's just a fat carp. I, I, it's not spawn-bound. It's not having trouble shedding its spawn. It might have built up. A, I don't know. I'm no expert, but I don't believe that fish was ill. I believe you know you see a lot of carp of that build now, don't you? Yeah, you, you not, wouldn't think it, it was. Was, was it like 37 when it when he caught it before? Wasn't it? Did he caught it once or once or twice? One, oh, I, I think once. So right, I think so. Right. Because it was called the old 38, wasn't it? So yeah. I think he had it at 38, as it goes. Yeah. Um, and it looked amazing, long. Mm. Um, but you don't see pictures of that very... He's, it's not in his book, and, and I, I couldn't tell you where you could find a picture. I feel like it's in maybe the... Re- I don't even think it's in Redmire Pool, but it's out there. Great fish. Uh, so I'm going to go... I'm going to go Yatesy with the Bishop by a nose over Terry with the Black Mirror. But June I'd the 16th love to have been, as well, wasn't it? I'd love to have been at either of those. Start, start Do you know what? I think in the year I was born, Si, as well. So, you know, no, dual 80, significance. 81 eight, was it? 80 I was 80, born, yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, I don't know what I'm going to go with. Why would you ask a question like that? I'm just curious. I think it's a great question. It's a great si. question, yeah, yeah, but with no prior warning. Yeah, but you're asking Al, who doesn't, who's like <laughs> been obsessed in his own fishing to the degree that he probably... <laughs> No, I'm not doing it to put you on the spot. If nothing comes to mind, Dad, don't don't worry. I, I would like to have seen Richie catch um, Basil. Yes, yeah, 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 for sure. He's um, you know that was a, that was an iconic picture, and um, surely Haywood catching the Black Mirror has got to be better than Till, hasn't it? 
Well, it was kind of. I mean, I'm sticking with. I just like to see him run into the phone box next. So we interviewed him about that. That was a. I. That's that was a great little story. Like in his multicolored yeah, shorts. Yeah, in his multicolored short. But catching a carp that they had no. Again, it goes back to that thing about the the shock factor. You know, obviously when Terry caught it, he knew what he was fishing. You mm. know, and I don't know Hayward knew what he was fishing for to a degree, but the. The it, shock factor. It wasn't out of, there, though, was it, really? No, until it, like, that. Yeah. If you were talking, could you document one? If I could document one capture, it would be the Black Mirror's first proper capture. You know? And they were quite stormy conditions as well, weren't yeah, they? So they, it was quite, like, yeah, you, know, it, you know. It's the best guy ever to have swam as a first, you know, and that's, that's what put it on the map. Yeah, so, I yeah, think if I could document one capture and be like, I filmed that, yeah, here it is, it'd be can that. Can you imagine it, the pressure? Of ha- I feel like we've had some pressured filming moments. Thing is, like back then it'd be just a, probably a camera just rolled, wouldn't it? It'd be like handy cam, so you just aim it in the right direction. I mean, there is obviously that kind of line of thought where you know, you, the more we smooth it out, and this goes back to what we were talking about capturing the moment with James there, like mm. where we're, we're, we're using that raw stuff. Like there is an element of there's a, there's a train of thought that says that you smooth something out to a degree where it all feels the same. Mm. Uh, and that's why a bit of handy cam sometimes gets you in the yeah. moment more like the John Mack Johnny Mac for, for instance footage, awful yeah. footage but yeah. but it's more authentic yeah. so yeah. I'd like to think that what we're trying to do is is authentic like we're not gonna we're not gonna like airbrush the shit out of stuff we're never gonna do that and I think we've now got the chance to document fish that the likes of the bishop hopefully one day that happens to us as well you know it's already happened to some degree but you know something seismic like that would be great to film it's the carp you don't know what you're gonna go and see like and I, like I've done it. I've photographed and videoed smaller fish, and over the years that leave a lasting. And it's the ones that you just, if you, that you just, you're not really sure what you get to expect when you, and then you get there, and it is it's better than you thought. Whatever, that's what, that's the great thing about being someone that gets called. You know, because me and Rich, we get called by people to go and do pictures, and and that's the good bit. It's when not not a carp that you know be the best carp in the world if you've already seen it once. Or you've already seen it in a magazine a hundred times, you know. It that's not the same as or certainly can take away from seeing one. Like the, but for the dustbin, for example, I'd seen that loads of times. But then when you see it in the flesh, it's better than in the in the pictures. But I think that that little bit of magic where, you know, this the carp isn't the most you're not so familiar with it, you don't know exactly what you're gonna get. They're the ones that leave the yeah, yeah, I see it from both sides, actually, yeah. I mean, seeing a fish that you're familiar with, sounds crazy, a fish, it could be a person, you know, anyone, couldn't it? But, I mean, just someone that, you know, they, you, you've, been, you've seen them so often, you're so familiar, and to, and to, and to see it in the, in, in, in the flesh would be, would be cool. But, yeah, that, that mystery as well. Do you think um, Passion for Angling, when, um, do, do you think that replicated, the, you know, his old Red Mire days quite well? With the mystery, what was the mystery fish Monster that was Myths. It? Yeah. Monster Myths. I mean, obviously, you're going right to the heart of my kind of influences here. <laughs> I mean, for most of us as well, I know that. I know that. We, we, passion will always, for me, be the best bit of angling TV, like, with respect to everything that's come after it. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to film with Hugh Miles um, and obviously with Chris. Um, and I know a lot of what went, you know, what went into that. And I, I think it would be fair to say that Hugh's idea of making a film was to show the very best of angling. So that meant revisits. That meant making sure you waited for until the, the, the light was exactly right. So I wouldn't say it was. it's not documentary. It's far from documentary. It's not what we do. Um, but that's why it took them four years to, to just to film it, you know, because and, and that's why it wore them out. Did he not enjoy that? Chris I think doing that. Chris, well, the conversations I've had with Chris would suggest that by the end he was exhausted. But Hugh is such a perfectionist that that's why Chris was exhausted. Because Chris isn't used to being driven like that. You know, he's he works at his own pace uh, at home. Um, and and passion was once they were committed. I think there was a certain degree of momentum that Hugh had to maintain to get them back out and back out and back out until it was perfect. And, and again, a bit like we touched on earlier, that's not that's not what we're doing. And I don't know if Passion got Passion got closer than anything I've ever seen to, to sort of explaining angling. There's no doubt. I'd love to do something like that, so si. I'd love to one day do make a film that gets even within the, the you know within the kind of 
the conversation about getting towards the, the nub of angling like Passion did, but I don't believe it's ever going to be replicated. Well, the myth still stays out there, doesn't it? Because there was the mythical fish that was in the lake, which um, which they never... Harry. Yeah, Harry, that's yeah. it, yeah. Um, He's good at remembering things, uh, isn't he? I've said this to you Monster before. Monster myths, as honestly. soon as he said that, yeah. <laughs> he does it all the time. Well, she, yeah. you know, and, and, it, and Monster Myths was demystified for me when we went to see Chris Ball because he not only named where it was, he explained how it came about, who the owners were, and there's a big story about behind the owners of the estate as well. But, but um, you know, apologies for shattering any myths, but, the, but unfortunately that lake, the dam burst and the, 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 the lake drained and the fish died. So... You know, are there two? They would be super old the now, fish anyway. Was found. No, they 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 perished. What was left perished. Right. As far as I'm aware, myths. They stayed myths. So myths. myths. They stayed myths. As much as the, they went back in Yates, he did catch an. Um, I think it was a 26 pound common. Uh, he did occasionally revisit. I like you would. <laughs> that's that's a, yeah, yeah. That's 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 poignant. And uh, like you say, yeah, those um, yeah, they remain as as myths. Before we wrap this up, where do you um, where, where do you see you know this digital stuff going? There's a lot there's a lot going on at the moment, isn't there? With um, do you guys look outside of the angling industry for more inspiration? Or I think uh, we touched on this kind of didn't we the other day? I I feel like a lot of the stuff that happens in the fishing industry is kind of happens elsewhere first. Um, do we actively? Do I actively look outside the fishing industry? No, you know I think um, a lot of the stuff we make is kind of just happens. We don't do a lot of planning. We try to this year, but actually a lot of the stuff we do is off the cuff. You know, there's an element of planning to stuff, but we just keep our ear to the ground. And I guess that's all boils back to being um, in touch with a lot of anglers and quite well connected in fishing because you know we've got loads of friends that do it we we know what's going on around us we, a lot of our films stem off the back of that sort of stuff um but i think yeah you know i love netflix i actually like i said to you i love i love telly and you do get influenced by things or i do but they're hard to it's very hard to watch something like that and think oh we can do that with topography because we don't it's just not the style you know we like rich has said before we shoot actuality and it's gone you know, you don't have the time to make, you know, the, anything you see on the telly, a lot of the time, they've made yeah. it look that way. Um, yeah, but yeah I don't know about... I, yeah. I, would, I would just add to that and say that, like, the, all the lads working in fishing, not just us, um, it is a really tough gig in the sense that you're working with something that isn't going to play by the rules. Um, we've shot so much and you're sat there on the last day and you're thinking we've got a brilliant shoot we just need a bloody mm. carp please because otherwise you're chucking the shoot away potentially and all that stuff you've shot and all the effort you put in goes to waste and when it does happen um, especially if you're shooting manual focus or, 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 or if you don't you know you've got seconds to react to something you've got seconds to get to make sure that you're shooting all the stuff you need in focus well exposed etc 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 and the fish could still come off so in the sense that can we look outside for inspirations about that kind of thing well there aren't many parallels so mm. like not many people have that element of doubt in their in their filming landscape you know a lot of it like El said there's a focus puller and the shot is planned there's marks on the floor where they've got to walk to we know nothing when we get there about how it's going to unfold and and we just do our best to capture that um, and that's all we can do mm. um, that's the best bit though as well yeah, like if we if we did plan it all, and it, I wouldn't even I don't think I'd even want to do it, you know. Yeah, be, because we just, can celebrate a capture every much every yeah. bit as much as the angler can, be, and we're together in that moment. And like as soon as the cameras r stop rolling, you know, we're high fiving or whatever, oh. you know, because it, because it's it saved our shoot, and, like and we've, we've got, got something. Yeah, that's the thing, you know. You don't like when you go fishing. You don't know if you're going to catch anything or not. When you go when we go filming fishing, it's no different. You know, a lot of time I'm fishing and filming or whatever, but that's the good that's one of the best things for us is that you don't you don't know what you're going to get and if we did if we planned all the captures like they probably do in a film you watch an epic film it's all staged it's all planned yeah no it is it's uh it's interesting to hear that because there's the you know 
you know, even you know, wildlife documentary, any anything really. It's it's there's an element of sort of planning, waiting for something. The that king you know we will shot. eventually. And so yeah. I got told by someone about all the best king. This is this will heart. This will break people's hearts. <laughs> but I got told a lot of the kingfisher shots, the best ones. The you know the they bait for them apparently. <laughs> With, they put tanks in the water, they put fish tanks in the rivers or whatever, buy their perches, they fill them with small fish and they and they sit there with their cameras and they're eating out of a tank. And, Is and that the, true? Yeah, and the BBC do get into trouble every now and again. Like Planet Earth gets in trouble every now and again when a story leaks about how they got a shot. But the point is, and it's the same with passion, if it gets, if it engages the audience and, 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 um, and the end result is something spectacular, then who cares? Um, mm. That's not something open to us because we're trying to. We're just, we're just praying yeah. that the fish, yeah. that the guy gets a bite, you know. Um, so we can't stage that. Uh, ultimately, we are totally at the mercy of nature, <laughs> of which is carb, mad. Yeah. yeah, that's the way it should be as well, shouldn't it? Keep it like that, guys. Thanks very much for coming on the show. It's, it's been great talking to you both. As Cheers, always, I. Thank you. Thank you. Thinking Tackle Podcast.